What's the worst music you've ever heard? For me, it's a circa 1970 album by Ornett Coleman called Science Fiction, which I once review as being the sound of a large waterfowl being sodomized with an egg beater. However, in 1972, there came along an album which bore the hallmarks of Coleman's distinctive influence, which so aroused and inflamed the critics that it earned itself the unfortunate and eternal epithet of the most hated album in jazz. This is The Righteous Bojamba, and it's time to talk about Miles Davis. In 1972, Miles Davis was at a crossroads. The preceding 16 years since he'd signed for Columbia had seen him become a leading light in the jazz world, redirecting the genre on numerous occasions, but it had also seen jazz fade rapidly in both commercial and broader critical regard with the rise of rock music. Davis had been very prolific in the latest phase of his career. Mid-1968's Miles in the Sky saw him finally complete the knotty post-bop, Tony Williams-dominated phase of his career and introduced both electric bass and guitar to the band. The next album from 1969, Fida Kilimanjaro, was for me personally an exceedingly difficult record, side one consisting of what Miles claimed was his response to the electric blues, but I find it very heavy going and again for me some of his least enjoyable music, but it must be acknowledged that the critics have been consistently rhapsodic about this music since the album was released but it did sow a seed that he was later to pursue. Side 2 on the other hand is brilliant, two extended pieces of atmospheric, almost hypnotic music that seemingly come from nowhere and was to form the basis of one of his greatest works, 1969's dazzling follow-up in a silent way. 1970 saw the triumph of Bitches Brew, a double album which made the pop top 40 and was, for a time, the biggest selling jazz album ever. For me, it's the classic case of the double album that should have been trimmed to a single, and that would have been done quite simply by tossing away disc one. Disc two is, again, brilliant, on a par with the best constructed rock albums of all time. It's an all but fully electric band now with layered keyboards, electric bass doubling acoustic, John McLaughlin's incisive guitar and slamming double drumming, with Jack Dijonet especially prominent. 1971's Jack Johnson bought the best of Bitches Brew and side two of Fida Kilimanjaro together, creating one of Davis's most undeniably classic albums. But it barely made the top 200 and Davis's pride was hurt. The overlong, underclever double live evil followed, an album which should have made better use of the stellar cast of musicians which it had, and it flopped as well. Miles, who was aggressively looking to make the crossover to the emerging young black punk oriented audience, began to see his bridges burning to the audience he helped create by pioneering fusion. Exhausted, coked out and starting to find musicians willing to come back and work again with his irascible personality were increasingly hard to come by, Davis had to retrench and make an all or nothing bid for relevance and direction. The one idea, the one concept he had in his pocket that he could work with and try to make that leap was the music from Side One of Fini Kilimanjaro. So, taking that, plus lessons he'd learned from Ornette Coleman, whose music he had scathingly disavowed a mere few years before, and German composer and philosopher Karl Heinz Stockhausen, and an expanded crew of musicians, some old but many new, 
Wiles went to work in June 1972 on his most controversial project. The end product, released in October of that year, was on the corner. A swirling, boiling cauldron of musicians competing with each other for space, sandwiched between a relentless and unshifting groove from the drummer, clattering guitar attack from the block with its stuttering bass or stenatos, all built around a single chord motif. More exotic instruments compete for space in the mix, including cello and an Indian orchestra with sitars along with the percussion, which at times doesn't seem to have been recorded with any reference to the rhythm section. But what is most notable is that with 15 plus musicians in the mix at any given time, how absent Miles is from the proceeding. He plays very little trumpet, preferring his own idiosyncratic organ contributions, and when he does play the horn, he does so often through a wah-wah, disguising it behind Reggie Lucas, yes, the Reggie Lucas, the man who produced Madonna's first album, and Dave Prima's guitars. Side one is probably best described as a suite, with tracks beginning and ending based more on tonal and textural variations rather than actual resolutions. The highlight of the album, the only thing that can really be described as a song, is the final cut Black Satin, which is more a rigid structure and an actual melodic theme, and the Indian instrumentation beautifully defines the opening and closing passages. The percussion really cooks on this one, in this case sleigh bells being pounded within an inch of their life and those recorded in another studio sounding hand claps. Miles plays his best trumpet of the album on the cut and in the middle of this unpromising field there suddenly sprouts a keeper for the best of Miles mixtape. Side 2, or for those of you in CD land, one on one Helen Butt, Mr Freedom X, is closer to a traditional album structure. Still impossibly dense, fierce and in your face music and very hard to listen to. But there's more tonal colour and a better interchange of leads, almost as if the musicians were finally digging Miles' master plan for the album. Even with that, the Helen Butt section goes on for about eight minutes too long. There's just too much instrumental treading water and the passages they're trying to sustain lack tension or dynamism. Producer Teo Massaro, who made his reputation as a brilliant editor and recontextualizer of Davis's music, could have been put to better use here. For such a divisive record, and we'll see just how divisive it was in a moment, the album made number one on the US jazz album charts, becoming only his second chart topper after Bitches Brew, and charted higher on the pop charts than the brilliant and accessible Jack Johnson. But even if the public was happy to give it a spin, the critics were relentlessly vicious. Not just the critics, it seems everyone involved in this record had some kind of quarrel with it. Barbs came thick and fast. Stan Getz, a legendary saxophone player whose heyday was some 10 years hence. That music is worthless. It means nothing. There is no form, no content, and it barely swings. John Brown of the influential jazz journal said it sounds merely as if the band had selected a chord and decided to worry hell out of it for three quarters of an hour. He also thought, I'd like to think that nobody could be so easily pleased as to dig this record to any extent. Bill Coleman, who wrote a 1974 biography of Davis, called the album an insult to the intellect of the people. Dave Liebman, who's the saxophone player on On The Corner, I didn't think much of it, and the music appeared to be pretty chaotic and disorganised. Paul Buckmaster, who worked on a number of Miles' albums as both a structurist and an arranger, it was my least favourite Miles album. Downbeat magazine was perhaps most damning of all. Lots of little background percussion diddle around sounds, some electronic mutations, and simple tune lines that sound a great deal alike and play some spacey solos. You've got a groove and formula and you stick with it interminably to create your magic. But is it magic or just repetitious boredom? Miles in his autobiography makes no mention of this negative criticism, but equally doesn't claim the album was a success in the mission he set out for it, and he moves quickly on from it. 
but he must have been wounded. On the corner was the last all new music he'd make in the studio for nine years. The subsequent albums, Big Fun, Get Up On It, Water Baby, were all hodgepodges. Sometimes brilliant ones of On The Corner or Bitches Brew outtakes, or studio sketches from those sessions, re-edited and redone. Where On The Corner's legacy would be more substantial and definite was on the series of thrilling live albums Miles issued over the next few years. The volcanic in concert, the ferocious juggernaut of Agatha, which for my mind of thinking is one of the greatest live albums ever made, and its wicked twin Pangea, and the positively serpentine, sulfurous and sepulchral Dark Magus. All of these records take the density and angularity of On The Corner, knock up the tempos and aggression. To add to this, Miles had released Black Beauty, another epic and fantastic live double in 1970. Five double lives, two double studios, two single studios and three double compilations of unreleased material in six years. Between that workload, the fact that he was seen as a sellout for trying to reach black kids on AM radio, and On The Corner was the most spectacularly wrong-headed music to be trying to do that with, the drugs and his own relentless personality, it's no wonder he burned himself out. For 35, almost 40 years, On The Corner languished while the rest of Miles' electric work was reappraised and elevated, especially in a silent way, Jack Johnson and Agatha. But On The Corner, which was still considered contaminated goods by the jazz community, and too outre and manic to turn of the millennial hipsters to champion, was still the pariah in the capital. I first heard it in 2000 when I bought my first batch of Miles CDs, Kind of blue, Fuga Kilimanjaro, On the Corner, Aura, and possibly Sketches of Spain. And apart from Black Satin, I found it every bit as mystifying and difficult then as I do today. Gradually, the album found a kind of home, largely through sampling and at first adoption by hardcore nihilist funky outfits, through a gradual filtering and modification via more widely known artists like David Byrne, Radiohead, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Nowadays, it's an album that seems to love the hip lip service too. Who'd have thought that Miles the Square Pig would end up the critical darling of the anything obscure is fashionable set? So, history lesson over. What have we learned from it? Is On The Corner a worthwhile investment for the adventurous rock fan looking to broaden their perspective, or is it actually deserving of its accursed nickname? Well, obviously the former, and equally obviously we can dispense with the latter. As Nat King Cole once said, critics don't buy records, they get them given to them. Now, right up front, along with the exquisite aura, On The Corner is the most unique studio album Miles was to make over the last two decades of his life. It's like nothing he or anyone else had ever done before, and its high points are better than anyone who wanted to take that music on the new directions could ever manage. There are some long stretches which can be quite tedious and the music doesn't really project any ambience in those stretches beyond its relentless jackhammer pulse. It's just difficult to be grabbed by the throat for 56 minutes and have this pounding, if occasionally fascinating music unwaveringly pummel your senses. Great albums are all about texture, nuance and shading. Look at the greatest album of 1972. Exile on Main Street is exactly that. Texture, nuance, shading. Ziggy Stardust's narrative facility and the way it shifts from punchy glam swagger to high camp theatre. Talking books uniquely shifting internal landscape. Machine Head's ability to dance on a stylistic tightrope. Harvest's ramshackle eclecticism. Superfly, which covers the same thematic turf as On the Corner, but does it with a genuine human insight, or the slider which shows all the facets of a fertile imagination trying to dissolve the boundaries of a genre rather than simply trying to create one in and of itself for the sake of itself. On the corner lacks that sense of variety, that sense of an artist indulging in their wider vision. 
It lacks, for me, the sheer enjoyability of reconciling the diversity of music in the collection. And it's not as if jazz doesn't encourage this. Kind of Blue or Giant Steps or Albums 2 of Witches Brew or Jack Johnson are positively Hegelian in the breadth of territory and concepts and diversities that you're expected to reconcile. And they are albums which go forward. Black Satin aside, there's very little you can tell that belongs to a place and a role in on the corner. I guess there's no critical parameter to say good or bad here. There's just difficult and rewarding. How much difficulty you're prepared to tolerate and how much reward you wish to seek will determine your final judgment on the album. So grab a plate of biscuits and a cool beverage and find a nook and a free hour to stream it or have a listen to the selections on the playlist which accompany this presentation. On the Corner surely doesn't deserve its reputation as the most hated album in jazz, but equally it'll never be the most beloved Miles album in my collection. I'd be curious to know how you feel about it. Good morning, my friend, Vigetus in and I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. What's your most hated music? What music horrified you and scarred you the most upon hearing it for the first time? I'd be fascinated to know in comments below. Also, what's your opinion of On The Corner? Do you think it's an unjustly maligned album or one which is now being righteously rehabilitated through judicious listening or unrighteously rehabilitated through people simply liking to overpraise that which is obscure. However, until the next time we meet again in good company or the nasty YouTube police shut down this channel, you keep listening to the good stuff and you stay righteous. Why do you think, Jim? Yeah.